Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. Last time, I mentioned a pirate ship at anchor in A Coruña, a pirate ship sitting alongside the Spanish expedition. Mostly, that was just an example of the many small timers out there. They were sailing and raiding and conducting illicit black market business all around the world. These kind of pirates were ever-present and omnipresent. Every colony out there had a crew or two of hard-living, hard-drinking sea robbers just kind of hanging around. And the colonies very much wanted it that way. It was good business. We're not talking about the fleets of privateers that colonies would sometimes employ in times of war. Those fleets were to defend against enemy invasion. But these small-timers, they weren't equipped to fight off a man-of-war or a frigate, much less a ship of the line. We're talking about ships that had maybe four or six guns tops. And these were not privateers. They didn't have commissions. They were pirates. But while these ships may not have been on the payroll exactly, they were an acceptable necessity. Say that you owned a fishing boat in the colonies, but then a few rival boats from the next colony over started fishing your waters. Now, it's not like there are ironclad territorial boundaries here. You can't take this issue up with the governor. But maybe your brother-in-law knows a guy that hangs around down at the local tavern. Maybe your brother-in-law will just saunter on down there this evening, buy that character a drink, and mention casually a hot lead on some fishing boats in the region. Within a few days, almost miraculously, your competition is gone. Now, you might take a small hit when the local fishmongers are selling suspiciously cheap fish for the next couple of days, but the problem is solved. No muss, no fuss, no magistrates had to ever poke their noses in. The pirates scored a prize, and you can continue on with your business. This kind of thing was commonplace. And it worked out for the authorities as well. As long as the harbor masters were willing to turn a blind eye for, naturally, a little taste of the plunder, then the authorities wouldn't have to worry about these kind of small matters. Plus, You know, pirates like this, they were territorial. They'd keep rival gangs of unfriendly pirates out of their waters, and thus out of your waters. If the pirates were smart enough not to attack your people or anyone who you were doing business with, then, well, what's the issue here? And should you need to commission that fleet of privateers in a time of war, these pirates could get the word out, and then you'd already have at least one ready-made crew for your privateer armada. Now, we don't talk much about these kind of pirates. You know, they don't raid Panama or seize treasure galleons. They don't cause international incidents. These kind of pirates don't make the papers, so there isn't a lot of story to tell here. Mostly, they stayed close to home. They spent their evenings drinking cheap wine with cheap women around fires on the beach, right? And sure, they might talk big and dream about the really rich game out there. I mean, who wouldn't? But for most of them, it was just a dream. Idle talk to pass idle nights. What do you imagine would happen, though, when a real pirate shows up on that lonely beach? Someone who'd been around the world and back with treasures that they could hardly imagine. But what happens when that pirate shows up and offers you the chance of a lifetime? This is episode 205, The Sword Shall Maintain Me. Let's take a look back to the summer of 1690 and the Battle of Port Royal. We haven't talked too much about that battle because I wasn't that interested in it. There's not a lot to glean from Port Royal that we haven't heard before. It looked basically like a buccaneer raid. A large squadron of English vessels arrived at Port Royal, and we're talking about Canada here, and they fired on the town. They bombarded it while the Marines went ashore, at which point the city surrendered to the English. But then something happened. 
something that upset the English. No one is sure exactly what it was, but when the English were upset, they did pirate things. Murder, rape, fire, defiling Catholic churches. They drank all the booze and they ate all the meat. It was all pretty horrible. And I'm not making light of the booze and the meat here. You know, alcohol was an important water purification tool. And that meat came from live animals that were currently providing milk and cheese and eggs. They weren't supposed to be slaughtered on that summer day, but now all of the booze and all of the meat was in English bellies, and the residents of places like Port Royal had some hard months of privation in their future. And really, the Battle of Port Royal looks not unlike a raid by Henry Morgan. Even the involvement of William Phipps looks like Morgan. You know, they were both future governors engaging in raids. And much like Henry Morgan at Campeche or Portobello, this raid was the origin story for a bunch of future pirates. You know, we've mentioned the possibility that Thomas II or Henry Every could have been there. But right now I want to focus on the smaller names that also could have been there. We don't know, since most of these pirates only show up on the historical radar when they start hunting bigger fish, but the time and the place suggest it's at least a possibility, if not a probability. For example, take the pirates Joseph Banks, Joseph Farrow, and Dirk Chivers. Now there's a decent chance that, unless you've read up on Henry Every and Thomas II, you've never heard of these pirates. All three were members of a small-time crew operating out of Rhode Island. As far as we know, they were never part of any West Indian buccaneer crews that did anything substantial. You know, just a a group of local ne'er-do-wells with a ship and absolutely zero desire to make something of themselves. Their ship was the Adventure, or maybe the Portsmouth Adventure, depending on the source you're using. The Portsmouth Adventure was a better ship than some other pirate vessels. It had six guns, ninety tons, and was capable of carrying sixty pirates. Of course, in Rhode Island, she almost never carried a full complement. You know, forty or fifty guys tops. Joseph Banks was the captain of the Portsmouth Adventure, with Joseph Farrow as her quartermaster, and well, we don't know the rank of Dirk Chivers, but he was probably an officer like a pilot or maybe a bosun. We know very little about their career. Everything in Rhode Island for the Portsmouth Adventure is virtually unrecorded. I've only ever seen one reference to Captain Banks before they get catapulted to worldwide infamy. We do have to assume, though, that they were somewhat active, because when an opportunity knocked on their door, they were ready to sail on a dime. Then again, before that opportunity knocked on their door, they may have been preparing to sail regardless. See, there had recently been an open invitation made to all men of fortune from every corner of the globe and an offer to join an expedition. This kind of thing was usually done clandestinely, you know, passed by word of mouth in dimly lit, dingy, dockside taverns, from relatively trustworthy lips to eager ears over mugs of rum. That's how business was supposed to be done here. But this invitation was shouted from the rooftops, figuratively speaking. Literally speaking, it was being sung on street corners, at the top of the singer's lungs, from Boston to London to Charleston to Kingston, all around the English-speaking world. This invitation was being sung by women working brothels in all of those cities. You know, any decent brothel worth its salt anywhere in the world would have a girl or two standing outside, a girl with a nice pair of lungs that would be crooning the men passing by, enticing them to come inside. And in the summer of 1693, every one of these women in the English-speaking world would have been singing this invitation. 
it was also being sung by young men and women on the streets that were trying to sell newspapers and broadsheets. We're talking about, you know, newsies. Extra, extra, read all about it, right? It's, well, it was kind of a new profession in the 1690s. Print journalism was kind of a new industry in the 1690s, and it wasn't yet totally fleshed out. Prior to the rise of print journalism, people relied on town criers. And while the town crier is often depicted ringing their bells and delivering the big news to everybody who gathers around them, that's for small towns. In big cities, the town criers would often stand atop a platform and sing the big news to anybody passing by you know, ballads about big defeats or victories in whatever war they happened to be fighting at the time. But as more and more printing houses opened their doors, and with the general rise in literacy, the practice of singing the news was slowly dying out. It would take at least a century more in rural places, but in this weird estuary of the 1690s, both those practices collided you would often find that handsome young man or pretty young woman singing the news on their platforms, but right next to them you'd find a stand that was selling broadsheet versions of those songs, and maybe, you know, they'd also offer some tea or coffee or maybe a meat pie. Or, if you were in a seedier neighborhood, maybe a tot of rum or gin. And in the summer of 1693, those town criers and those siren singers outside the brothels, and the singers at every tavern in the English-speaking world, they were all singing this song. Come all you brave boys whose courage is bold. Will you venture with me, I'll glut you with gold. Make haste unto Carunia, a ship you will find. That's called the fancy, will pleasure your mind. Captain Every is in her and calls her his own. He will box her about, boys, before he has done. French, Spaniard, and Portuguese, the heathen, likewise, he has made a war with them until that he dies. Her model's like wax and she sails like the wind. She is rigged and fitted and curiously trimmed. And all things convenient has for his design. God bless his poor fancy. She's bound for the mine. Then away from this climate and temperate zone, to one that's more torrid, you'll hear I am gone. With an hundred and fifty brave sparks of this age who are fully resolved their foes to engage. These northern parts are not thrifty for me. I'll rise the anterheist that some men shall see. I am not afraid to let the world know that to the South Seas and Persia I'll go. Our names shall be blazed and spread in the sky, and many brave places I hope to descry, where never a Frenchman e'er yet has been, nor any proud Dutchman can say he has seen. My commission is large, and I made it myself, and the capstan shall stretch it full larger by half. It was dated in Corona, believe it, my friend, from the year 93 unto the world's end. That's not the end of the song. There is a bunch of nonsense for a few verses about how Henry Every was the black sheep of a noble family from Plymouth, but was disowned and turned rogue. None of that's true at all, but it's good copy. What's weird, though, is that it's all written in the first person. The name of the song is Verses Composed by Henry Every, lately gone to sea to seek his fortune. Most modern scholars dismiss the possibility that Henry Every wrote this song. They dismiss it completely, just out of hand, and they should. They're right to do so. Stephen Johnson writes in Enemy of All Mankind, quote, As enticing as it is to imagine the newly appointed Captain Every tinkering with his rhyme schemes as he sails past the Strait of Gibraltar, the verses were almost certainly written by someone other than Every himself. End quote. I 
I personally imagined Henry Every at Saleh, just past the Strait of Gibraltar in Morocco, but, you know, close enough. What's weird, though, aside from some clearly fictional personal history of Henry Every, it's weird how much this ballad does get right. There's nothing in it about the mutiny itself. Those details were still a closely held state secret in England, but what it gets right about Avery's character as a captain and a person. For example, the verses continue, quote, I honor St. George and his colors I wear. Good quarters I give, but no nation I spare. The world must assist me with what I do want. I'll give them my bill when my money is scant. Now this I do say, and solemnly swear, He that strikes to St. George the better shall fare. But he that refuses shall suddenly spy Strange colors abroad of my fancy to fly. For chivalies of gold in a bloody field, Environed with green, now this is my shield. Yet call out for quarter before you do see a bloody flag out, Which our decree No quarters to give, no quarters to take. We save nothing living. Alas, tis too late. For we are now sworn by the bread and the wine. More serious we are than any divine. Now this is the course I intend for to steer. My false-hearted nation, to you I declare, I have done thee no wrong. Thou must me forgive. The sword shall maintain me as long as I live. That last bit has quite a lot to unpack. This whole ballad has a lot to unpack. And most of that we're going to hold off on talking about until we talk about the cult of personality, the celebrity that built up around Henry Every. But those final verses do hit surprisingly close to the mark in a number of ways. It's saying that Every flies the colors of St. George, which he doesn't, But it says that he's going to be friendly to those that do, or that are willing to dip their own flag to the flag of England. And that's true. But then it says that refusal to do so will see Henry Every fly the red flag. Which, of course, Henry Every is going to do. Now, that's not surprising. You know, the blood red flag, the Sali Rouge, well, that was the symbol attached to men of fortune. The black flag wasn't in common use yet, and the symbols that were going to define the Jolly Roger, well, they could maybe be traced back to Henry Every himself. It's all pretty clear that whoever wrote this was not Henry Every, but whoever it was had some intimate knowledge of Every and what happened at Acarunia and after. There's one thing above all that I really want to know. How does the author, whoever he or she may have been, how did they know that Henry Every and the crew of the Charles II renamed their ship the Fancy? That happened at sea, after the mutiny was over and done, once those officers had been sent ashore in that rickety boat. We haven't even talked about the name Fancy yet, and I can't find one mention of the name Fancy in any of the depositions of those officers who were aboard the ship when she was taken. It doesn't appear in the record until several months later, and it's not confirmed by some of the pirates that were aboard until years later. And yet this song, allegedly written by Henry Every, which appeared mere weeks after the mutiny itself, this song somehow knows the name Fancy. It's a name that only a few dozen men currently coasting along the shores of Western Africa should rightly know. I don't know how, and I don't know why. But someone in England was privy to some inside information here. There is a lot to unpack in the verses. So much so that many academic papers have been written about them. Joel Bayer does some extensive analysis in British piracy in the Golden Age. For example, he points out that England had a long history of verse-based crime reporting. Songs about murderers or brigands or thieves, that kind of thing. 
and those songs were often presented in the first person. Much like the verses of Henry Every, they call them songs of the self. But those first-person songs about crime were almost always remorseful. It was from the point of view of the criminal, but after the fact of the crime, repenting for their crimes from usually a jail cell or sometimes from the gallows. According to Joel Bayer and to Stephen Johnson in Enemy of All Mankind, the only other example of verse-based crime reporting that takes place while the crime is still ongoing, as it is in Henry Every's verses, and the only other verse-based crime reporting that does not have repentance as the central theme, the only other example of that are the ballads of Robin Hood. And the verses, the Henry Every verses, they definitely do have a touch of the Robin Hood about them. You know, they paint Every as a nobleman. He's a, a good Englishman. But his family and his nation turned their backs on him, so now he's going to fight back. It's all very Robin Hood indeed. It turns him, much like Robin Hood, into almost a folk hero. But what there isn't in the Every verses is any hint that he's going to rob from the rich and then give to the poor. The verses say that the world must assist me with what I do want, and I'll present them a bill when money is scant. If one were so inclined, one could read that as a Robin Hood for the age of the birth of capitalism. As I said, there's a lot of potential analysis and a lot to go into about the verses. And we will talk about that eventually, really dissect the Henry Every verses, but we'll do so later on. For now, I want to focus on what effect the spread of a ballad like this might have on some of those smaller crews, like that of the Portsmouth Adventure. Maybe their crew was sitting around their fires on the beach with their cheap wine and hired women, dreaming about their big score. And then, one of those ladies maybe shared this song. These women would have been far more up-to-date on current events than any of these scruffy sea robbers. It was part of their job. I mean, really, news and conversation were as much a part of the job as anything else. They may have been the people to tell Joseph Banks and Joseph Farrow about Henry Every's mutiny. The ballad begins, Come all you boys whose courage is bold. Come venture with me and I'll glut you with gold. It's... It's a call to action. It's almost a dare. Were I a member of a crew like that, I would... Well, I'd enjoy the rest of my night, but come morning, I might bring it up. I mean, what if we did it? What if we sailed out there, met up with Every, and were glutted with gold? I imagine these kind of scenes were playing out all along the coast of the English colonies all around the world. But even if the crew went so far as to vote on it, I imagine that most would vote in the negative. You know, Persia? Who wants to sail around the whole world? We're making decent money right here, close to home. And sure, we might get rich, but we might just as easily die in the attempt. Here, we've got steady money, good wine, good women, and a far smaller chance of a horrible, horrible death. But imagine that you're sitting around with your crew, debating the possibility, at least discussing your options. But then down the beach you spot a figure walking toward you. High boots, a fine coat, long hair pulled back, and as he gets closer you can spot some telltale signs. The way he walks, maybe an earring, maybe tattoos. He's clearly one of you, you know, a a man of fortune. But then he arrives and introduces himself. His name is Thomas Wake. He's the quartermaster of the bark Amity, lieutenant to Captain Thomas II. And Thomas Wake has a proposition for you. And it's all a bit superhero team-up origin story. You know, I'm putting together a team of exceptional individuals, but Thomas Wake was actually out there recruiting. 
Thomas too had made clear his decision to sail for Arabia, and he was going to answer Henry Every's call to adventure and join forces. I mean, Thomas too knew those seas better than most, and he'd won the richest prize in a generation, maybe, for pirates at least, maybe ever. And Thomas too wants you to join his fleet and sail for Madagascar. You've got a decent ship and a ready-made crew and a few guns, which, of course, they can bolster once you're underway. In Madagascar, you'll find women and drink and riches beyond your wildest dreams. It's far better than this chilly corner of Rhode Island. There were certainly crews that said no to this. They didn't want to go to Arabia. But the crew of the Portsmouth Adventure took a vote. They voted in the affirmative. And while their captain, Joseph Banks, elected not to accompany them, he did give command of the Portsmouth Adventure over to Joseph Farrow, who was going to sail alongside the Amity and Thomas II for Madagascar. Next time we're going to talk about Henry Every and the crew of the Fancy at sea. When Every hears about the verses that had been penned in his name and decided to pen a response. A letter, a real letter by Henry Every to every Englishman in the world. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I'd like to thank everyone who has helped to support the show. Everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon or left us ratings or reviews or just recommended this show. You all make this possible. Thank you. Our theme music, as always, was The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you have not checked them out yet, you absolutely should do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. And as always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.